I think for us, it's really both growth and profitability. Maybe two, two caveats is that when we first started this focus in 2018, 2019, everyone was saying that, Calvin, you're just not focused enough. Is it growth or profitability? And that's something that we've insisted, uh, insisted and that has really helped us to date. But also at the same time, we realized that when it comes to quality, you can break down into many other many matrix and that frankly, at any single point in time, there are some balls that we need to leave hanging at the air while we try to solve others so that we can achieve the balance of it. But for us, it's growth and profitability. One of the things that's top of mind for us right now is uh, predictable growth because we are the first movers or creating this category on, on both sides, uh, which means, um, you know, a lot of the early time was spent in educating uh, the market. So telling brands the importance of communities and how consumers are shifting there um, and it's not accessible. Uh, similarly, for community creators, uh, upskilling them, training them so that they're able to run, you know, the, the sustain their communities, uh, run campaigns which are adding value to brands. So we spent a lot of time doing that. A lot of growth for us came through inbound and referrals. Like we work with 180 large enterprise brands. This is all in last two years. And this is all remote because we started when literally COVID hit. The month COVID hit is when, when we went uh, uh, live. Uh, but now we've realized that in order to massively scale, it is predictable growth, which is why what's top of mind for us is getting into a lot of channel partnerships you know, with agencies, with, you know, Google, Facebook. Uh, so that's that's one. Second is we're setting up an outbound engine to proactively reach, reach out to large uh, enterprises. Uh, we're also going to uh, focus on brand building now because uh, it's it, we're the only ones creating this market right now, it seems. So there's a lot of uh, work to be done in bringing this front and center. We are in quite a unique position. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are in the same position where we are, we are kind of Web 2, but kind of Web 3, kind of Web 2.5. So as you guys know, um, 2020, 2021 has been an excellent year for Web 3 startups. Um, and then we, we, we look at the last six months alone. Um, six months ago, I would say that Web 3 companies can easily raise money, right? We see pre-product pre -product companies raising $100, $150 million valuation. And to be honest, that has really dropped quite a bit, right? Funding has really dried up on the Web3 side. So for us personally, um, we have always been focusing on delivering the value. So even if you go to our website today, try try that, you, you won't even find the word blockchain, right? So we focus really on providing value to the clients and, and what we do for them. So that has actually put us in a unique position where um, we haven't really been that much affected by the whole you know, drop in the Web3 uh, uh, funding cycle. Uh, so, so far it's been so good. Um, but also related to another question there is that um, we've been more focused on getting very quality top line numbers. Um, and that means really focusing on the right clients, um, changing some of our strategy to be a lot more focused, looking at clients with higher unit economics, and that has actually helped our funding so far. You know, a lot of people don't know this, but, um, oh, so, so anyway, uh, Australia is our second market, thanks, Mark. So a lot of people don't know this, but um, education is actually one of the top three export of Australia. So people think uh, dairy, cows, um, coal, commodities, Actually, education is a huge one. So for us, having started our business in um, education sector, helping to verify um, certificates, transcripts, degrees, diplomas, so on and so forth, it allowed us to export whatever we have over here into a new market very easily. And, and of course, that doesn't mean that uh, we don't focus on our home market. So Singapore is still a very key market for us. Um, and I see some of our partners here, like, like Francis from IMDA. Uh, we still get a lot of support from the uh, public sector. What we've done is we, first of all, stress tested all our numbers. So we assume there's going to be like zero revenue growth, also because there's inflationary pressures and all of that. And then, then we saw what would be our cash flow situation. Because uh, we, we're also going all out and hiring and, uh, you know, for the top line growth. So we did that. And then, you know, we, we wanted to make sure we have two years worth of cash in bank. Um, we didn't want to raise right now. We want to raise a little bit later once we hit a certain milestone. Uh, so we're considering maybe doing a bridge round from our existing <coughs> investors uh, because we want to raise around when we hit our next 
uh, milestone. But I think that stress test was very important to do because based on that, we said, we're going to go all out and hire in our revenue function, but maybe we won't hire in tech and product. We're, it just puts things into perspective, assuming there's zero growth for the next 18 months. Uncertainty is the reason we need judgment. If, if there is no uncertainty, there is no need for judgment. The more uncertainty, the more difficult the judgment, the more uncertain we are of the future, the more noise we're going to have. The most important thing in a situation like that is to broaden the spectrum of the perspectives that you're getting and to get enough different perspectives, get enough independent different perspectives so that you can see the breadth of the possible outcomes. It's very easy to say in hindsight, but you know, if you had asked people at the beginning of the COVID epidemic, you would have had people telling you, oh, you know, the world is going to hell, don't start a business today because it's going to be a disaster. But you would also have had people telling you, you know, in three months it will be over and we will have forgotten about it. And both points of view were obviously extreme and wrong, but it just showed you the range of possibilities. Another thing that shows you the, the difficulty of making predictions like that is that if you go back, in fact, to the beginning of the COVID time, just about every economic forecast or other forecast that was made confidently was wrong. I'll just give you an example. Number of bankruptcies in most developed countries, if you had asked 100 economists, will there be more bankruptcies in 2020 than there was in 2019, they would have unanimously said yes, obviously. It turned out there was less because they were not counting in the reaction of the, the, uh, the, 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 the various government and economic authorities that contracted it. Another very striking example, this time from the US, there was a big concern at the beginning of the COVID epidemic that there would be a spike in domestic violence. In fact, there was no more domestic violence during COVID than there was at other times. There were more reports of it because there were more neighbors listening so there were more calls to domestic violence hotlines, but they were about the same number of incidents. Uh, partly because, again, there was a reaction, a preventive reaction. There were awareness campaigns being done so that the neighbors would call and so on. So it's very difficult to make forecasts. And that basically tells you that even when you think that you are very confident in a forecast in a period of uncertainty, and these would be forecasts on which you would have been very confident, you could be very wrong. You should really make extra effort to make sure that you get a broad diversity of perspective and that you challenge your thinking to imagine what could be the aspects of the situation that you're missing. In doubt, if you're not sure about growth versus pro profitability, in my view, always prioritize profitability. Or if you are going to fundraise between high or lower valuation, in my view, always prioritize lower valuation. And the reason is this, right, that the risk is asymmetric. If you are too profitable, you can still leave to find another way, or if another day, or if you have left money on the valuation table, you can come back and claim again the next, next round by higher, higher, higher uh, financial results, right? But if you got the, other, the decision wrong in the other way that, hey, the valuation us is, is too high, the down round risk is really big, or hey, you run out of money, you run out of money, you are dead, right? So, so in my view, the risk is asymmetric. If you, if you really are not sure, prioritize profitability as well as lower valuation, right? For us at this stage, what we want is really not um, become profitable. What we want is to have the option to become profitable. Right? So for example, in our company today, uh, when we look at our accounts, about 50 to 55% of our spending is on R&D. So that means building products for the future, either for our existing clients or products that can help us get new clients. So at any point of time, if I were to turn that switch, then we can turn very profitable because our unit economy is very high. But at our stage, it doesn't make sense. So we keep that option. So we have strong bargaining power against clients, against partners, against investors. But anyway, so at this stage, I, I don't think for us it's, it's so much on profitability alone.